Hello, and welcome to Brightstream TV. I'm your host, William Everhart, and this week we're going to be taking a look at Adobe Illustrator. Now, if you uh, have signed up for our newsletter, you may have gotten uh, a little bit of a misprint there on the newsletter that went out. And uh, it said this class was Illustrator, uh, a sprint course. So normally our sprint courses are just kind of generic in nature. And we take you through a project from start to finish and just kind of show you uh, basically what we would call the fundamentals of that particular application. Well, that's not exactly what this show is about. It is Adobe Illustrator, don't get me wrong there. We are going to be doing Illustrator, uh, but this week it is Illustrator for eLearning. So we are still going to put this in kind of a sprint format. We're going to go through uh, actually two projects here and uh, if we have time, a third project. So you'll actually see how Illustrator works, uh, but with a slant towards the e-learning environment. Okay, so um, if you have questions, you can always reach us via Twitter at hashtag AskBrightStreamTV. And uh, that's during the show, after the show, whenever. Uh, post questions there, comments, we love to have that. Um, and, and we want to hear from you. Now, if you're joining us live, then you can use the chat pod here to post your questions. And I'll be monitoring those questions uh, live during the show. And that's what Brightstream is all about. It's giving you live training that you can interact with here uh, with your instructor. So let's take a look at um, what we have on the docket for today. So of course, we're gonna be taking a look at Adobe Illustrator from the standpoint of e-learning. So one of the things that um, we want to cover here is, well, exactly what is Adobe Illustrator? We want to talk about the Adobe interface. Uh, the interface uh, is actually spans all of the Adobe applications, which is really nice because if you learn one, well, then you, you know them all. And then we're going to dive into some projects here. Now, once again, these projects are kind of based towards an e-learning environment. So things like creating a custom button, creating a slide background. And then if we have time, I just want to show you uh, how to draw a rather complex shape uh, within the Illustrator environment. Now, the complex shape can be anything that you want to create. I'm just wanting to kind of flex those Illustrator muscles here a little bit in that particular project. And then we're going to wrap this up by showing you how to export any of these graphics that you create in Adobe Illustrator for your e-learning applications. So um, we have quite a few topics here to cover. Um, like I said, we're gonna kind of make this um, uh, kind of a sprint course. So you're gonna have a project here from start to finish, show you how to, how to create these projects. Um, but we're gonna do all of this in an hour, maybe an hour and some change. I tend to get a little long-winded, but we're gonna try to keep it as close to an hour as we possibly can. And uh, so let's dive right back into Illustrator and take a look at, well, exactly what is Adobe Illustrator? <clears throat> so I wanted to define for you exactly what Adobe Illustrator is and kind of how does that fit in an e-learning environment. So the question is, well, what is Illustrator? All right, well, a simple definition is it's a vector drawing application. And now you're looking at me going, it's a what? A vector who? Yeah, a vector. So maybe I should define what a vector is and well, what do we have other than vector drawing applications? Is there other types of drawing applications? Well, there is. Let's take a look. So a vector drawing application just simply relies on polygons rather than pixels to represent your graphics. And now you're still scratching your head going, it does what? So it's using polygons. Uh, to define the graphics, so um, geometric shapes, but they can be really kind of any shape that you want. You're not limited to, you know, just these faceted uh, polygonal shapes. There's actually more than that. So maybe to, to help simplify this a little bit, uh, let's take a look at a simple graphic here. If I were to describe a simple shape like a triangle in a vector drawing tool like Adobe Illustrator, I would define the three points of that particular shape. Now, this could be any shape I want. It could also have curved sides like a circle. 
But all I'm describing using this tool is the vector points. And I've marked those here on this triangle. Those are the little white squares you see at the points. So I'm telling my application here, this is the area in which I want the shape to appear. And so it kind of connect the dots there and creates the triangle. Now what do you have uh, other than a vector drawing? Okay, well the other side of the coin is a raster drawing. Now a raster drawing or graphic uses pixels instead. So pixels are just little squares of information. Um, in this case it's typically color, but it could also have transparency in there as well. So is it somewhat see-through? And so raster graphics, um, to describe that same uh, triangular shape, I have to use these little cubes, these little squares. And I create kind of like a little pyramid here. Now the problem between, uh, or, or the, the difference here is, is pretty substantial. In a vector graphic, I get nice smooth sides and crisp corner points. In a raster graphic, maybe not so much. And so I generally have to have what we call a higher resolution uh, for a raster graphic. Just a higher resolution. Resolution just means the number of pixels per square inch. So I have a higher concentration. So if I have more pixels in a given area, then obviously those pixels have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the higher the resolution, the higher the concentration of pixels per inch, well, the smoother the graphics will be. But they're always going to be this kind of little stair step. So what does that mean for you uh, going forward with the Illustrator? Well, it simply means that Illustrator graphics can be sized up or down without any hit to the quality. So, because it doesn't rely on those pixels, there isn't a, a concentration uh, of, of pixels or a resolution. Uh, Illustrator graphics are what we call resolution independent. You can scale them up, scale them down, doesn't matter. The other thing you should know about Illustrator is that it creates highly customizable graphics. And they are used, of course, in print, in web, mobile markets, and you know now pretty much everywhere. So we're seeing it show up uh, it just about in every market, anywhere that someone needs to create uh, graphics, whether it be for a logo or some type of layout. Uh, movie posters a lot of times are a combination of Illustrator and Photoshop, um, and, and they're combined together to create those elements. So Illustrator is pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's just you may not know that that's the tool that was being used for it. Now Illustrator uh, does work with images, but I can't directly edit an image inside of Adobe Illustrator. So if I have a photograph and there's something in the photograph like a mailbox that I want to remove, I can't do that in Illustrator. But if I want to take that image and put it in my Illustrator layout and then perhaps hide maybe half of the image, maybe have that image fade off into nothingness, maybe into the background or something, that I can do in Illustrator. So I can incorporate imagery and other graphics inside of an Illustrator layout. It's just I only have a certain level of control over those external elements. Okay, well I hope that gives you a little better understanding of kind of where Illustrator sits in the world of, of all these different applications. And so uh, what I want to do is just kind of give you a slant of how we would use a tool like this, a vector drawing tool, in an e-learning environment. Okay. Well, let's dive back in and let's take a look at the uh, Adobe interface. So any tool, doesn't matter if it's an Adobe tool or, or, or any other kind of application, um, you know, if you want to get efficient, you want to save time with that particular uh, tool or application, you really need to learn your way around inside that environment. And the Adobe interface is, it's not that easy to, to pick up, but once you get it, um, it, it works in all of the applications because they've tried very uh, diligently to make all of the applications um, look and feel the same as far as the interface goes. Yeah, they, do, they perform different functions, they have different tool sets, but the overall feel of things, where do I go to find this, or, or how do I work with a menu or a particular tool, all of that still is basically the same. 
So this is just a little screenshot. Now this particular screenshot comes to us from uh, the Macintosh environment. And uh, the Adobe products are, well, they're, they're uh, OS agnostic. They don't care. Um, they function the same. The keyboard shortcuts are obviously a little different. Um, and the only visual change that you'll see between the two applications is right up here at the very top. This is the first area I want to talk about. This is your menu and application bar. So between the Mac and the PC, this could have a little bit of a difference here. The Mac environment wants to keep control over the menu bar, so it tends to keep it separate uh, from the rest of the application. Other than that, it, it functions the same. So the menu bar is where you'll go to issue different commands. The application bar has a few more commands in there, uh, and we'll take a look at those once we get into uh, the demo side here. Now right below that, you're going to have this little section. Now this is your control panel. And in here, you can select an object and you can get some feedback about that object. What color is in it? Is it? Does it have a stroke or a border on it? What size is it? Where is it positioned? Just different things like that. And you can even issue commands or changes from this control panel. It's going to be one of your best friends when it comes to uh, working in tools like Adobe Illustrator. Coming on down the left-hand side of the screen there, you have your tools panel. Now, the tools panel um, has quite a few tools. In fact, there's more tools than can be displayed. And so there are certain tools in there that actually have tools hidden underneath them. They're kind of stacked on top of each other. I'm going to show you how to access those hidden tools in a bit. You'll also note that down there at the bottom of that tool panel, there's a, a white box and then a little uh, offset from it, a little black box. That is your current fill and stroke. If you have an object selected, the, the contents of that object will display in those two areas. What color is inside the object and does the object have a border color? That's called the fill and the stroke. All right, moving on. Down here across the bottom, this is a status bar. Um, you've got a few things here. You can um, zoom in and out with this little status bar. If you have multiple pages, which Illustrator doesn't have pages, it has what they call artboards. Uh, but if you have multiple artboards or pages here, you can navigate between those. Um, you can also uh, use a horizontal scroll bar that's down there to the lower right. Okay. Coming down the right-hand side of the screen here, I have various panels. Now, in this particular screenshot, these panels are in an icon mode. So you click an icon, and then a panel pops out like this one. So in this case, the stroke icon was clicked. Now, the stroke in the world of Adobe refers to the border of the object. Okay, So when you hear me say stroke, that's what I'm talking about, the border of that object, the outside edge of it. And so this panel flies open. I can make adjustments here. And if I'm finished with the panel, I don't want to use it anymore, I can click on the same little icon there in the, uh, to the right there, and that panel will close. Okay. So that's kind of the basic uh, of the interface. It's really, uh, for new users, sometimes it's a little confusing, especially if you're coming over from the world of something like Microsoft where everything is across the top there in a ribbon. Um, yes, we do kind of have a ribbon here, but it's not exactly the same. What Adobe has done is broken it down into what they call panels. And that's the closest correlation I could make to uh, a product like uh, Microsoft, is that the panels would essentially be your ribbons. But instead of being across the top of the screen, you can move them wherever you want. Now, mine are generally docked to the right-hand side of my screen, uh, but you can move those panels around and customize the interface to the way you like to work. All right? So that is the Adobe interface. And what I want to do is uh, just dive right in and start working on our first project here of creating something like a button. Okay? Now, in an e-learning environment, um, you may use buttons from you know, whatever your e-learning tool is, whether that be Storyline or Captivate. They do have built-in buttons, um, and they're great. Nothing wrong with those. But occasionally, you're going to want to maybe create a custom button. Maybe you need a special type of icon, 
or you know you just really want to just up your game a little bit instead of using just the standard square and rectangular buttons you want something a little more creative and that's where Illustrator can help you out so let's take a look at drawing um, a button here a custom button here inside of Illustrator All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to Adobe Illustrator. Now, I'm using the latest version here of Illustrator, and Adobe goes through and changes uh, a few things every now and then, trying to keep the product on the cutting edge. And so one of the latest changes here um, is this screen that you see. You, you open it up, and, well, there's nothing. It's just kind of blank here. Occasionally, you'll get some marketing uh, materials down here at the bottom. Um, but really, um, this is just a little interface here for you to be able to go through and, and either create new documents or open uh, recent documents. And so what I want to do is I just want to create a, uh, just a new document and show you what that is all about. And then we'll open another document. So let's say I want to create a document yeah, I got, I've got this little new button right here. I click on that, and I'm presented with the new document window. Okay. So I can give it a name, and I can also choose a profile. So I'm just going to call this maybe a custom button. Okay. Now the profiles. Okay. Because I'm going to put this towards, like I said, an e-learning slant, I want to set up this document for that type of output. Now our e-learning applications, uh, things like Storyline, Captivate, uh, PowerPoint, um, you name it, there's a ton of them out there. Whatever it is you're using, odds are it's not going to use a vector graphic. It's not going to like that. It won't import it. So what we have to use would be something that is raster based. So why would I use a tool like Illustrator? Well, vector-based tools are much easier to manipulate and make changes to. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll export this content for use uh, like a raster object. Okay? So I do my development work inside of Illustrator. I get things the way I want them. I export a raster image. I place that image inside of my e-learning tool. And then if I need to make changes, well, I can go back to my native Illustrator file, make the change, and then just export a new copy. Pretty simple. So um, when I build a page here, or I build a new document inside of Illustrator, I am looking towards what is the final product. And my final product, I know it's going to be used on the web or on a mobile device. Odds are the e-learning content is not going to be uh, professionally printed. So that's why I'm going to choose what I choose for my preset. Let's take a look. So I could certainly build something for the web or for devices. You can also export content for video and film. So if you're using a, a tool like uh, a Premiere Pro, you could certainly export for that. But I'm going to choose this one. It's called Basic RGB. Okay. And the RGB stands for red, green, blue. Okay. Now this is going to be um, most likely what I would choose each and every time I was wanting to create content for uh, e-learning is this RGB because that's how my e-learning tool understands color is typically RGB okay so we're gonna describe this document in those three colors here so the size here I can choose from various presets here or I can create my own custom size totally up to you your unit of measure what is it that you use well those are listed right here now, I, I'm just a good old fellow from down here in North Carolina, and so we like to use inches uh, rather than points, pikas, pixels, and that sort of thing. But that is completely up to you. Uh, I work in all of them, actually, uh, but, of course, I'm most comfortable with something like inches. So I'm going to choose that. For the width and the height now, I can put in a custom value. Okay. So you, you don't have to change this. You can always resize it later. And when we export this content, it's really not going to matter because I can have it export just the button graphic itself, not this entire page. So I'll generally leave the page pretty large. Now the rest of these components, I pretty much just leave alone. We don't really need them. So I'll just tell this OK. And now I have a nice uh, big work area here. Okay. 
Now I'm going to go up here to the top, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain here, and I'm just going to reset my workspace here so it looks maybe a little more familiar to you. So I've got this large document. Down the left-hand side of my screen is the tool panel like we saw earlier. Across the top is the menu bar and the application bar combined here. I have my control panel, and then down the right-hand side, I have all of these other panels. So there's that stroke panel that I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to open that panel up, and the panel only shows me one property, weight. Now this is the thickness of that particular item. So what I can do is, in the upper right-hand corner of every panel is a small icon here, a little drop-down menu. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to say Show Options. Now, each panel has a different menu. It's always in the same location, but it'll be different items in that menu. In this case, it's just showing me all the different options I have for applying a stroke or a border to an object. Okay, so that's a panel. Now, if I want to collapse this panel, I simply click on the same stroke icon, or there's these little double arrowheads right here inside the panel itself. Clicking either of these will collapse that panel. Now it's still here, the icon is still right here, so if I ever need to get back to it, pop it open. Okay, so this is um, our new document. Now I can start drawing in here. So I just want to take a few moments and just show you some of the basic drawing tools and techniques. And then we're going to jump in and, and actually uh, I've got a, a special document for you that you can trace to create the button that we're going to create. All right, so over here on the left I have my tool panel. Now the way they've done this is they have little sections in here and you can see there's little in horizontal indentations in the bar and those are marking the different sections. So the top section, there's four tools, there's actually a fifth tool up here. Um, those are all of your selection tools. Okay. Now I said there's a fifth tool. At the very top, on the right hand side of the toolbar, there is a, kind of a light gray or white arrow there, it's called the direct selection tool. Notice that there is a little chip in the corner of that tool. So there's like a little corner missing on that button. If you click and hold on that tool with the missing corner, you will pop open a new menu here. And this is where you can select the other hidden tools. So you can see there is a fifth selection tool called the group selection. Okay? All right. Now the next section is all about drawing. So I have pen tools, curvature tools, type tools, line tools, shape tools, all kinds of cool stuff in here. And what I want to do is uh, I'm just going to use this rectangle tool. It's in that leftmost column. Okay. And when I do, it's going to pop up with this little message here. Have you tried the new such and such, whatever. Uh, I'm just going to dismiss that. Okay. Now if I wanted to draw with this tool, I simply mouse out over into my artboard somewhere. And I have a choice. If I just click, I'm going to get a dialog box. So it's okay, I want a box that's one inch wide and two inches tall. I click OK and it creates that box. Now notice this, here's another difference between Adobe applications and a lot of other applications. I still have the, the shape tool targeted. I'm still using that shape tool. So it doesn't switch me to another tool like a lot of other applications do. They'll default back to like a selection tool or an edit tool. Adobe doesn't do that. They assume that maybe you want to draw more than one shape at a time. So they just keep whatever tool you had selected. That remains active. So if I just click on the page, I can put in a specific value. What if I just want to freeform draw this? Well, for that, you just click, hold, and drag. And then I can drag out a box, any size that I want. Pretty cool. Now underneath that uh, rectangle tool, if I click and hold on it, there are other basic shapes in there and they all function pretty much the same. If you click, you get a dialog box. If you click and drag, you can freeform draw that shape. All right, so we're gonna do a little more with those in just a bit. Now below the drawing tools, you have what we call transform tools. Okay? So there are things like a rotate, a scale, um, there's a width tool, just various items in here. I'm going to use this rotate tool. Now I still have the last little rectangle here selected. And so if I use this rotate tool, I'm going to click on it once, 
um, this rectangle remains highlighted and there is a little blue crosshair right in the center. That's its reference point. So now I'm just going to click and drag anywhere outside of the shape or actually right on the shape. doesn't really matter. And I can rotate this in any direction that I want, but it's going to rotate from that little blue crosshair. There at my mouse, I'm getting a feedback as to the amount of rotation that I'm getting. Pretty cool. So all of the transform tools work pretty much in that same way. Um, underneath the rotate tool, you have a reflect tool, so creating mirror images. You also have a scale tool. You have a shear tool and reshape tool. Okay. Now, I don't really use the scale tool or the shear or reshape too much because you also have another feature here inside of the uh, Adobe interface. And this works with most of the applications, but most especially the vector drawing applications like Illustrator. I have a shape here selected. And if I go to the top of my toolbox and I click on the very first tool there, the selection tool, then my box that I still have highlighted here gets these special little symbols wrapping around it. Okay? And these are what we call handles. Okay? And they're on by default. So if I wanted to make this box a little taller, maybe this way, I could grab this center handle on this edge and just drag it in the direction I want it to grow. There we go. Now I see that uh, someone asked, uh, can you uh, reselect the first box and manipulate it? Absolutely. That's the other feature of this particular tool, the selection tool. It selects things. So if I mouse over this first box, I can click on it and I can still edit that box. You see, I get those little control handles on it. So if I wanted to make it larger, if I grab, say, this corner handle, I can change its height and its width at the same time. If I'm using one of the side handles here, I can only move in that one direction or change it in that one direction. The other thing that you can do with this is that you can, with this particular tool, I should say the selection tool, is that you can select multiple objects. Okay? So I have this larger box selected. If I hold down my shift key and I click on the other box, you see now I have both of them selected. And then I can either move them. This tool will also move your objects. So as long as they're selected, just mouse over them, click, hold, drag, and you can move them. I can also scale them as a group. You see they have this outer box here, what we call the bounding box. And it has those same transform handles on it. So if I grab, let's say, this top corner handle, I can scale those objects together. Pretty cool. Now, if I wanted to scale those proportionately, as I'm dragging, you see, it'll let me just kind of, you know, do whatever I want with them, squish them, whatever. So what I'll do is I'll hold down the shift key as I drag, and that scales them proportionally. I release the mouse button, and there we go. Okay? So um, selecting objects, creating objects, transforming objects. Pretty cool. Now the rest of the tools in there get a little more specialized, probably a little more than what we can cover in this particular course, but we'll have additional courses about those tools. The only other two tools I want you to be aware of are the bottom two tools here. There's a little hand there and a little magnifying glass. So the magnifying glass allows me to click on an area and zoom in. The hand tool allows me to grab my screen and move it around. Now it's not moving the objects. Let me be clear about it. It is not moving these objects. It is basically moving or panning my camera. It's an interactive scroll. I can scroll up, down, left, right, any direction using this hand tool. Now I've zoomed in. How do I zoom out? Well, you can use the zoom tool. It does have a minus mode, but personally, I find it easier just to go up here to the view menu. And right here, there is a zoom in, a zoom out. And the one that I like is this one, fit all in window. Boom. It zooms out whatever the percentage it needs to fit the entire artboard in this window. So I can see everything that's on this artboard. Okay, so that's just 
kind of some basic um, um, creating here inside of Adobe Illustrator. Just some really, really simple stuff. How do we create some objects? How do we select them? How do we transform them? Zooming in, zooming out, okay? So let's take what we've learned here and actually create a custom button. All right, so I have an exercise file for you, and I have a little template in there that you can trace off of. So if you're following along with me, hopefully that'll help you out a little bit. If you don't get it perfect, it's okay, it's not a big deal. You can always edit this, and that's the real beauty of using a vector-based drawing tool, is that it's so easy to manipulate what you've already created. And you can do it again and again and again, and it's not gonna harm anything. All right, well, let's dive back in, let's open that file, and let's go ahead and create that button. So now I wanna to go to the file menu. Now I'm gonna leave my, uh, my little demo document open here, and I'm just gonna open another document. So if you've downloaded the exercise files, um, be sure to follow along with me. If you haven't, that's okay, just take notes here, or maybe if you wanna just try it on your own, just keep working with the document you have, you can make up the shapes. So I'm just gonna to navigate to my Illustrator for e-learning. And uh, lesson two one. Two one. Okay. So what you're gonna see on my screen here are these kind of blue outlines. This is like a little template, okay? So someone asked here, I, I'm just seeing this, um, um, asking about how to download the exercise files. Those are, there's gonna be a button there just below uh, my screen there. If you just scroll down a little bit, you can download those uh, right there, okay? All right, but once you get them, uh, those, are, those are free for you to use. Whenever you want, you can come back and um, uh, uh, review this and, uh, and use those exercise files. All right, so what I've done here is all these little shapes that you see on here, these are what we call guides, okay? It's, we're gonna use them as a little template, okay? So the first shape that I wanna create is this outermost shape here, okay? So I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna grab my rectangle tool, okay? And I'm just gonna try to line up along the top edge, top left edge of that object. Okay, I'm gonna click and drag down. Sorry about that, I have to chirp and make noises when I draw, that's just me. So I'm just gonna drag across, and I'm gonna stop here before I get to the bottom point. So I'm gonna stop where that rectangle starts to go into a point, and then release. Okay. Next, uh, I want to just grab and put a, uh, a path here so that it kind of goes down and back up. Okay, so I want to modify this existing path. Now I've got a couple of choices for this. One, I could just draw a triangle on top of it, okay? Or I can modify this existing path. And the choice is really up to you, okay? I'm gonna to choose to modify this existing path, okay? So how am I gonna go about doing that? Well, what I'll do is I'm gonna go over here to the left and I'm gonna locate another tool. I'm gonna to grab the pin tool. Now when I do, those control handles disappear on my object. The object is still selected. And then right here in the center bottom edge of that uh, rectangle I just created, I'm gonna mouse over it and my pin tool has a little plus sign beside it. I'm gonna click right there, and it's gonna add a vector point to this object. So now that it has a new vector point, we can move that point, and it's gonna transform that shape. Remember what I said about the vector, it's, we just describe the points, and Illustrator does the rest. It fills in the blanks, kinda of like connect the dots. So I'm gonna grab the, uh, the other selection tool up there at the very top. Come up here to the top of your tool panel, on the right-hand side, the Direct Selection tool. With that, I'm gonna grab that little anchor point, that vector point that I just created. I'm gonna mouse over it, I'm gonna click it once, and then I'm gonna click and drag it down. And as I do, you can see this shape changing. See that? Pretty cool. When I release it, you see there's no more cross member there. It has been reshaped. All right, awesome. 
So that's the outermost shape. Now I could replicate that here on the inner shape, but um, you know, I'm kind of lazy. Uh, I'll admit it. If there's a shortcut to be taken um, and it doesn't sacrifice quality, I'm going to take it. Okay. So the shortcut that I want to use here is uh, the ability to just shrink this object. Okay. So to do this, there's a couple of methods, but the easiest way for me I've found is to go up to the object menu. Now in the object menu, we can do different types of transforms. There's all kinds of cool stuff in here. But the one I'm interested in is right here. It's called path. There's a submenu there, and it says offset path. So I want to offset this path, basically move it in all directions. Okay? Grow it or shrink it. Okay? Now how much do I need to grow or shrink it? Well, I don't know. So there's a preview button here. I'm going to turn that on and I actually get a preview. It shows me this little item here. Okay? Shows me a preview of what's about to happen. Now, when I do this, I'm going to say, well, it's getting larger. So the offset is 10 pixels here. What I want to do is I want to change that. I'm going to do a negative. I'm going to type a minus sign and then I'm going to do 15 pixels. And then I'm going to click here where it says miter limit. And that's just going to update that preview when I click in the miter limit. And now we can see that this little shape shrinks right down to fit my little template. Isn't it wonderful how these things work out? Okay. I'm going to click OK, and there we have it. So that offset command actually creates a copy of the original and then offsets it. So now we have two objects here, the original and this new one. Pretty cool. All right, let's, uh, let's go on to the next shape here. Um, I'm going to do the little cross band here. Okay. So I'm going to go back over here to my shape tools. I have a rounded rectangle tool. Rounded rectangle. I'm going to select that. I'm going to mouse over, once again, the top left corner. I generally draw top left to bottom right, but you can draw in any direction you want. I just click, hold, and drag. Draw this out. Now notice that you know, the rounded part of it is probably a little more round than what we had set up in the template. It just depends. Okay? So this shape is a little more round. It's kind of like bulleted ends. So how do I fix that? Okay. Well, one thing you could do is just to delete that shape and then try it again. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to delete that shape. I'm going to come back over here, grab that rounded rectangle tool, and I'm going to click and drag again, but I'm not going to release the mouse button. Okay? So I get it in a position, but I don't release the mouse button. With the mouse button still held down on my keyboard, I'm going to tap the down arrow key. And hopefully you can hear me tapping that key. And you can see that it actually adjusts the corner radius, the roundness of that shape that you're drawing. So as you drag, keep the mouse button held down and tap the down arrow key to make it smaller, the up arrow key to make those corner races larger. Pretty cool. All right. Now, once you've drawn something like this, if you decide, well, no, I think I like the corner radius a little larger or a little smaller, uh, the newer versions of Illustrator give you these little bullseyes here. And you can see them in each corner. Those will allow you to click and drag. You can click and drag those to change the corner radius of these objects. That's pretty neat. All right, the last thing we need to do is draw this little triangle here at the bottom. Now we do have Underneath the shape tools, we have a polygon tool. Well, a triangle is a polygon. So if I drag out a polygon, now the polygon draws from the center. Most of these tools draw from left to right or side to side, but the polygon tool draws from the center. So if I drag out this polygon, you can see it's going to give me the default uh, of a hexagon. Okay. Well, once again, I'm going to keep the mouse button held down and I'm going to tap the down arrow key and it starts removing sides. Oh, look at that. Now I've got a triangle. 
I'm going to drag down to the point here and release. I'm going to switch tools back to the regular selection tool. And then this object, you see it's a little two-pointed, if you will. I'm going to move it back. So I need to uh, scale it. I can grab one of the corner handles and I can start scaling it. Now the only downside to grabbing a corner handle is that it will move that center point. So you kind of have to do it from both sides there a little bit. And it's not always perfect. Okay. Now if I want it to be perfect, I'm going to undo that. So Command or Control Z to undo a step. And I have to undo a couple of steps there. That allows me to take this back, all right? So instead of using those control handles, what if I did something like maybe a scale or perhaps even use the direct selection tool? Now that's my preferred choice is the direct selection tool. So I'm gonna go back to that direct selection tool, okay? And this time I'm gonna click out here in the background somewhere. Just click once and that removes all those little handles, all that information, okay? And what I want to do is just mouse just over that top edge of my triangle here. I'm going to click, hold, and drag it straight down. Now, I can drag it in any direction, and it's going to deform this object. So as I drag, I'm going to hold the Shift key. And that's going to make sure that I drag straight up and down until I get to this point. Okay. Well, it's pretty close, but it's maybe not quite wide enough. Well, I can still use the same tool. If I mouse over this top left point, I can click hold, drag it to the left. If I click on the top right point, click hold, drag it to the right. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, creating just different little simple shapes here. Now, I saw there was a question here about layers. Yes, there are multiple layers inside of Adobe Illustrator. Um, I'm keeping these projects pretty simple so that you don't have to use those. Um, but when things start getting more complicated, absolutely, we would use layers. And if you're unfamiliar with layers, um, these are just organizational groups for your work. So if you were to break down a, a more complicated graphic or, or maybe a layout, you might use layers to group different elements. Now, now, you do have grouping inside of Illustrator as well, where you can select multiple objects and group them together as one object. Uh, the layers are a little different than that. They, they allow you to, to put elements on these different layers and then change their stacking order. Um, they're very, very powerful, especially in a tool like Adobe Illustrator, but it's a little more of a topic than we can get into here. So um, when you start getting more complicated graphics, you're definitely gonna, probably going to rely on layers. Okay, so uh, let's dive back in and let's add some color to this little guy and let's wrap it up. Okay, so now that I've got this, okay, I've got my basic shape here. I wanna go up to the view menu for just a moment. And in the view menu, down towards the bottom, you're gonna see this thing that says guides. Uh, another little pop-up menu is gonna pop up over there and we're gonna choose hide guides. And that's gonna hide all that blue stuff that was there. That's the little template. So now we just have the various shapes here. Okay, now we built them in a specific order and there's a reason for that because these elements stack on top of each other. So I'm going to start adding color to them. And so someone asked about a, a palette. Okay, um, uh, the layers palette, yes, it's a, it's a panel. Yep, sure is. It's these two little sheets of paper here called layers. Um, the really cool thing about it is that if you open up that layer there, there is a little disclosure triangle here. You can click on that, and these are all of the objects that are on that layer. And you can actually target these by clicking in this little uh, area out here to the right. You can target those individual members. So as I click in this little blank space here, it's actually selecting those various objects. Now, some of these objects are hidden. So these ones down here at the bottom that say guide, they're not actually here. They're being hidden from view right now. Okay, so there's your layers panel. Pretty awesome. All right, now what about colorizing um, this object? Well, over here on the right, we have various colored tools. There is a color panel, 
And if I go to the menu bar and I show options for it, you can see I can mix up my own custom colors. There's a little rainbow here I can sample from. Um, there's also a swatches panel. Now the swatches are just like pre-built colors. This is like your, your Adobe Illustrator box of crayons. They're pre-built for you. Uh, so you're not having to mix the colors up. And that's what I'm going to use here. So to use it, you basically just select the object, you come over here to the swatches panel, and at the top of the swatches panel, and you'll also find this in the color, other color panels, um, there is a, a little indicator here at the top. Are you changing the fill or the stroke? So if I click on stroke, and then I click, oh, let's say this bright red, it's actually changing the border of that object. If I want to change the fill, well, I have to make sure that the fill icon is forward here in the swatches panel there at the very top. And when I do that, I can see that it has already chosen white. So I don't want that. I want a nice dark orange. There you go. So you just repeat this process for each of your objects. Now there is also a drag and drop feature. I'm not super excited about this feature. Some people are. Uh, it can get you in a lot of trouble in a real uh, hurry, but you can drag and drop elements. Like if I drag a swatch and drop it onto an object there, it will change its fill color. So if you're into that kind of thing, drag and drop, by all means, go for it. Okay. So let's say this is our, our little small custom button here. There you go. Creating these graphics, adding color to them. All right, so hopefully it gives you a little better understanding of how to draw elements here inside of Illustrator. And we are just barely scratching the surface of the drawing techniques that you can use here inside of Illustrator. This tool is so extremely powerful. Oh, it would just be days uh, of me teaching you how to do this. Uh, and you probably don't want that, at least not right now. So there'll be future episodes here where we dive deeper into the different aspects like layers uh, inside of Adobe Illustrator. So for now, let's dive back in and let's take what we've learned here and uh, step it up a notch. How about we do something a little different and let's create a backdrop for uh, a slide maybe in your e-learning presentation, okay? So similar tools, just different project. Okay, so what I wanna do right now is just go ahead and save this document as I have it. So I'm just gonna go up to the file menu and choose save. Now, we were working on an existing document, one that I had already created. Uh, so it's not gonna give me any dialogue. I just save it, it saves over it. Now, if you are saving a brand new document, like this one that I created earlier, when I go to choose save, it's gonna ask me where do I wanna put it and what do I wanna call it, okay? It will also give me options for the file type. So Illustrator CC is the latest version, but I can drop this all the way back to Illustrator 3.0 if you wanted to. Why would you wanna do that? Uh, maybe you have someone who's using Illustrator, but they don't have the latest and greatest version. They can still open the file using Illustrator and edit the file. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna come back to this document for a second. Let's go ahead and open the next document. Okay, so I'm gonna open and let's do lesson 3-1, a simple slide background. Okay. And look at that, we're already done, wow. No, this is the little sample file again. So let's say we wanna create kind of like a little starburst effect here or something like this. This is really just two shapes. It, it looks more complicated than that, but it's honestly just two simple shapes. And I'm gonna show you exactly how I created this. So if you have this document and you open it, it opens to this first artboard. To the right is another artboard, okay? So if I just scroll to the right, there is another artboard here, okay? The first thing I wanna do is, let's say the background. So I'm gonna zoom out here a little bit so we can see both of them, okay? Get a little comparison here. So I wanna create this background here. How do I do that? All right, well, that's basically just a big rectangle filled with a gradient. Okay, 
So I'm going to grab my rectangle tool. I'm going to mouse to the top left edge of my artboard here, or my piece of paper, and I'm going to click, hold, drag, to create the shape. Now, by default, it's going to give me whatever my default settings are, which is a white interior, or fill, and a black border. Okay. Well, in this case, I don't really want a border on it at all. So how do I remove that? Well, I'm going to go back over here to the swatches panel. Okay. So my fill color, I'm just going to start out with a basic RGB blue. But then that border color, if I click on the stroke property there at the top, little stroke icon at the top of the swatches panel, then at the top of the swatches, there's one called none. And that basically removes that color. So there will be no stroke or border. All right. Now, let's work on that fill a little bit more. If I look in here in my swatches, if I scroll on down, there's all types of colors here. Like I said, it's like a box of crayons. Um, and then when I get down here a little bit further, there's this thing called white black. That's a gradient, okay? So if I apply that, I accidentally applied it to the stroke here because I still had that stroke selected. So I have to switch, make sure I click on the fill property, then come down here and select the swatch that I want. I'm going to use the white black here in this case. Okay. So now that I've got this gradient on here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. It's a linear gradient, so it goes from left to right, white to black. We can change it. The first thing I want to do is change it from linear to radial. To do that, I need another panel. Over here on the right, I have a gradient panel. If I open that up, it shows me the object that I have selected and the gradient that's currently in use. At the top, it says the type. I'm going to change it to radial. So now I have a little circle that radiates out. Perfect. But now I want to change the colors. Okay, well, in addition to the gradient panel, you also have a gradient tool. So over here in the toolbox, in the right-hand column, a little more than halfway down, you'll find gradient tool. I'm going to click on that, and what we're going to see is we have this circle, okay, and this line here in the center. That line represents that gradient, okay. You can rotate the gradient, but in this case, it's a circle, so rotating it really is not going to do a whole lot for us. I can click over the edge here where the dotted line is, and I could just kind of follow this little path out to where it, that little watch dial, if you will, out there to the end, and I can stretch it a little further so I can make the gradient go further. Okay, But what about the color? Well, when I mouse over the center part of the gradient, over this little bar here, there's these little tabs. There's one here at the center, and if I double click it, I can choose the color of that item. So I can mix up a color, or right here, this is my swatches. I can choose from one of those uh, box of crayon colors over there. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just choose this lighter color here. Pretty cool. And then I just want to change that outside edge. Uh, right now it's black and I don't want that. I want it to be a real dark blue. So I just mouse over this outside edge here. There's a little color chip there and I double click on it. When I do, once again, I get the little color pop up and I'm going to choose a really, really dark blue. Kind of like that one. Okay. So now that's getting me started here. But now this is going from the center. What if I wanted this highlight kind of to be kind of down here to the lower left? Well, I just mouse over the, the center part of this gradient. There's a little black circle there. I'm going to click it, drag it, move it. Check it out. I can extend this a little further. And now it's starting in that corner and it's working its way out. Pretty cool. All right. So that gets us the gradient. You can put a gradient on pretty much any shape. You can drag it in any direction that you want. What about these other items here? How do I get these little starbursts, these little radial arms here? Okay. Different ways to do that. I'm going to show you what I consider to be the easiest way to do it. 
Once again, I'm gonna go over here to my shape tools. This time, I'm gonna choose the ellipse tool. Now here on the ellipse tool, I'm gonna start about where my gradient, the, the origin of my gradient, kind of down here in the lower left. If I click and start dragging, it's gonna draw left to right, okay? So while I'm dragging, I haven't released the mouse, I'm gonna hold down my Alt key, and that's gonna force it to draw from the center. If you're on a Mac, that's the Option key. And then I'm also gonna hold down the Shift key, and that's gonna make sure that it's a perfect circle. So I'm gonna drag out a perfect circle right here. I release the mouse, then that Shift and Alt key. Now, it's gonna use the same gradient, okay? That's its default now. Well, that's okay. I'm gonna go over here to uh, my swatches once again. The fill on this case, I don't want it to have a fill, so I'm gonna turn that off. I'm gonna choose the none swatch. And then I'm gonna to switch to the stroke option here. And so the stroke option, you might choose a, a lighter blue. I'm gonna choose a real pale blue here for that. Now for the rest of this, to actually create the, the radii there, those little um, rays coming out from it, I want to change the stroke. So I'm gonna to go to the stroke panel. You'll find that over there on the right hand side as well. The weight is the thickness, okay? So I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna to go to the highest setting it has, which is 100 points, and that's not gonna be enough, but you can start to see that, uh, that light blue color taking place there. Pretty cool. Next, about the midway point of the stroke panel, there's a thing called dashed line. I'm gonna just turn that on and look at that. Instant little starburst here, pretty cool. I'm going to continue to increase the weight of the line. Well, the drop down, the max on it was 100 points, but I do have these little up and down arrows beside the weight. So if I click that up arrow, I can keep increasing it, or I can just highlight that number and type it in. Okay? So I'm going to type it in. Uh, I'm going to set it to like 150. And then I can just enlarge the shape. See that? And so now I'm getting this kind of crazy starburst pattern here. Just want to make sure that, whoops, it goes off the edge. As long as it goes off the edge there, I'm good. I'm going to use my layer, tool, uh, layer panel over here to target that circle again. I lost the circle there for a moment. Okay, so this is just one way that you could create something like this. If it goes beyond the borders, not a big deal. So these rays just fall right off the screen. It's not a big deal, okay? That information will be cut off when we export it, okay? So you can see over here in the weight, it just, when I scaled it, it scaled the weight of the line too. So it just went crazy with it. Okay. So I'm gonna go back over here to my layers panel. I'm gonna target that ellipse. Once again, to target an object like this, if you can't find it here on the screen to select it, come over here to your layers panel. You can locate it in here by clicking on the uh, little gap here to the right of these elements. Okay. So if I'm really just kind of hung up on this and I want to make sure that those rays get cut off, I can take this element and the element behind it. Okay. And I could perhaps maybe cut the first element and insert it inside the second element. Okay, so that's perhaps what I'll do. So I'll just select the uh, outer radius here, the, the circle, and I'll just cut it. I'll go to the Edit menu, choose Cut, and I'm going to select this object, my background. If I go back to the Edit menu, there is a Paste command. There's a Paste in front, a Paste in back, Paste in place, but there's not really a, a Paste inside like we'd see in some other applications. 
Well, it's just hidden. So with this background element selected, I'm going to go over here to my tools panel to the very bottom down here. There's three little icons, draw normal, draw behind, draw inside. I'm going to choose that last one, draw inside. Now I go to the edit menu and I'm going to choose this option, paste in place. It pasted that starburst, that thing I created, inside of this object in the exact same location that it was in when I cut it. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to get out of this draw inside mode because if I draw anything else, it's also going to be restricted to the interior of that rectangle. And I may not want that. So let's go down here to the bottom of the panel, the tool panel here, and I choose that draw normal again. There we have it. So you just created a nice, crazy looking little starburst background here. Of course, you can change colors, you can lighten it up a little bit, uh, do all kinds of fun stuff like that. Okay. So that's just two different elements that, you know, using simple drawing tools to create some really uh, creative and decorative pieces here. We've created a little icon for a button, and now we've created a, a slide background. So um, we're, we're running close here on time, and so what I want to do is show you how to export these elements over into a format that we can use inside of something like Captivate or Storyline. So it's at this point that these vector objects must be converted to raster objects because remember, tools like Captivate and like Storyline and Lectora and PowerPoint and all these other um, uh, e-learning tools, they, they don't accept vector objects very well, if at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to export these and, um, and then we'll show you how to import them into uh, a tool like that. Okay? So let's dive back in and let's export our background and then we'll switch back to the other document and export the button. All right. So in this case, I have two artboards and this is important for you. You can have as many artboards as you want within an Illustrator document. Maybe you have different variations on uh, this background or this graphic. You might want to duplicate that graphic, put it on a new artboard, make a change. Who knows? You could have a whole series of buttons, maybe have different themes or something like that for those buttons. And so you can kind of group them by their artboards. All right. Well, in our case, we just want to export this second artboard here. How do we do that? All right. Well, first, I'm going to go to the File menu, and I'm going to save this document as is. Now, it's going to save it as a native Adobe Illustrator file. Okay. Next, I'll go back to the File menu. And you have some options here for this. Um, one of my favorites here is called Save for Web. Now this is kind of interesting because what it's going to do is it's going to take the active artboard, the one that I was working on at the time, and it's going to export it in whatever format that I want. Now, working with tools like uh, the e-learning tools, or the development tools, it's a lot like working with the web. In fact, most of them are based off of some type of HTML technology. Um, not always, but for the most part, that's what they do. So if I export this for the web, it should work in those tools. So over here on the upper right-hand corner, there are different presets that you can use. Do you want a GIF, you want a JPEG, or you want a ping? It's really up to you, but for me, in this case, I don't have any transparency, so I don't really need a ping. Ping is great for transparency. Uh, I do have a nice... Uh, well, you know, I do have a nice blend of colors there. So a GIF may not be the best option. If I do, I might choose like the highest property here, uh, actually run the colors up as, fa as, as high as I can to get the best uh, overall quality. But you could run into some banding here in the background, and I can actually see it here. You see little, it's almost like it changes abruptly in color because you are limited to the number of colors you can use in a GIF. So, you know, it might work for you. The other option here is right in between, and that's a JPEG. So if I use a JPEG, I should get uh, pretty decent quality, although you may start to see a little pixelization here in the center. So you have to pick what is going to work best for you. To me, I think a JPEG with something like, oh, I can run the quality up a little higher. 
and get a real nice smooth gradient here. Nice. I'll hit save and I can give it a, um, a background name. So I'll we'll call this my starburst. Oops. Backdrop. Just going to drop it in my folder here and hit save. And there we go. So the active artboard was the one that was exported. And if you look at my screen here, I'm going to zoom in just a touch. And you can tell the difference here. Uh, the one on the right has this little black border around it. That artboard is active. If I click on that first artboard, you see the black border jumps to it. That's the active artboard. Okay, so that's exporting something that has a full coverage. You know, it's the full size of my slide covers everything. What about this other document? What about this little graphic? Okay, I don't really want this white background. I want that to be transparent, if any at all. Well, for this, I'm going to do basically the same thing. If I go up to the File menu, I'm going to show you another option here. I showed you Save for Web, but there's another one here called Save for Microsoft Office. So if you happen to be using PowerPoint, great. What it's going to do is it's going to export this as a ping file. Ping support transparency as well as quite a number of colors. I can choose, well, that's about it. That's all it's going to let me do. So I have no choices here. Okay? So I'll export that out as a ping, but I didn't get any choices for that. So that's why I really prefer this method, the save for web because in here now I have some choices. So up here in the upper right hand corner I can choose the ping. Okay, So my background now has this little gray and white checkerboard that indicates transparency. But look I've got this huge background here and I really don't want that. So over here to the right in the image size properties there's a small little option that says clip to artboard. If I uncheck that, look at that, it automatically shrinks it down to just the outer bounds of the artwork. Pretty cool. I'll go ahead and hit save. And I'm going to call this one button 2. Okay. Either method should work for you. But like I said, I personally like using the save for web because, well, I like the control that it gives me. I can make choices as to, well, what format it's going to be in and whether or not I want the entire transparent background or just to clip it around the artwork itself. So there you have it. Uh, exporting your uh, Illustrator graphics into a vector format that you can use inside of your e-learning projects. Now, in the case of the button, uh, some of you may be asking, well, I need, say, a hover state and a down state. Well, absolutely, you could do that. You could come back here into Illustrator, perhaps duplicate uh, this button that you have, put it on a different artboard. Uh, that way, when you export it, you're only getting one button at a time. You can export each artboard. And then you just change the colors on, on those graphics, on those individual artboards. And that would give you your multiple states, your standard state, your at rest, your hover, and your down state. Uh, if you needed a visited state, well, that's just another artboard and just change the graphics again. So um, it, you are going to be treating this as an image inside of your e-learning tools, um, and you're just going to swap those images out based on the states. Okay? So that's it. Um, Illustrator for e-learning. Well, I hope you've had a good time. I've hoped you picked up a few um, uh, tips and tricks here on kind of how to use Illustrator in your e-learning environment. And be sure to check back with us here at Brightstream TV. We try to publish a show every week, uh, and it's always something great, we hope. Uh, we'd love to hear your comments, so be sure to hit us up at hashtag AskBrightstreamTV uh, using your Twitter account, or you can email us at training at Brightstream TV. Well, I'm your host, William Everhart, and I'll see you next time here at Brightstream TV.